Hello, everyone. I'm uh, George Isaac. I'm a senior scientist with the Cloud Physics and Severe Weather Research section of Environment Canada. And I see my, my opening slide is all screwed up, but uh, at any rate, bear with me. Um, there are a lot of people that have contributed to this talk. Um, I put them down as contributors rather than authors because they haven't seen the talk. So uh, at any rate, you can see their names listed here. All of them are is in the same section that uh, um, I'm in. Um, this study is funded from a wide variety of sources, including Transport Canada, the Search and Rescue New Initiatives Fund, NAP Canada, and of course Environment Canada. And I want to th especially thank my colleagues at uh, our um, numerical weather prediction centers in Montreal, and of course uh, my um, uh, aviation colleagues at uh, both in the east and west. And uh, Bill Burroughs, who's done a lot of work uh, that's helpful in this work, and he's also in our section. This project started off as the Canadian Airport Nowcasting Project, and it was basically to produce short-term forecasts, zero to six hours, or nowcast of airport severe weather. Um, and I'm going to show you some of the products that we've developed and um, tested at both uh, Toronto and Vancouver International Airports. The project has evolved from that into longer time periods, et cetera, but I'm going to describe that as we go through the talk. So the CAN now, or the Canadian Airport Nowcasting Forecast System, uh, has been described in this paper, which is available online now, and you can go to it. But it basically ingests all the surface measurements, the radar data, the uh, we have some on-site remote sensors, the NWP model data, satellite data, lightning data, aircraft data, um, climatology data, and terminal area forecasts. Runs it through scientific algorithms, which predicts things like visibility, runway visual range, ceiling, gust, precipitation, wind shear, turbulence, crosswinds, airport arrival rate, cat level, et cetera. And we also uh, introduced some now casting methods, which I'll describe later on. And we output this onto a, um, a website and I'm going to describe that as well a bit later on. We've done a lot of algorithm development um, in terms of visibility and fog. Um, I might say that visibility uh, restrictions are due to pure fog and also snow and also rain. So we've got algorithms for both of those. We're also uh, calculating runway visual range. Runway visual range and visibility are both the same in daytime conditions, but at nighttime uh, they're different. And you need the runway visual range in order to get cat level. So, of course, in our winter situations, that's very important. We're calculating ceiling from the model uh, using both cloud fraction and or a um, um, condensed uh, water uh, threshold. Uh, we're not doing much in blowing snow. We're calculating turbulence, wind uh, gusts. We're doing a bit on icing, precipitation type, precipitation intensity. We're doing a lightning forecast, and we're doing some real-time verification. This just shows you the, we have, this is Toronto International Airport. Uh, we have a MET compound here. The blue are the runways at the airport. And it's close to the existing um, MET compound at the airport. We have 21 instrument bases with power and data feeds. And we've got a wide variety of instruments on those data feeds, uh, including um, you know, the standard stuff like uh, winds and uh, temperature, pressure, uh, and relative humidity. Um, cameras and so forth. We also have salometer, um, visibility meters, and many different uh, precipitation gauges. Some of the in more interesting stuff are we have a microwave uh, profiling radiometer, um, and we have a vertically pointing radar, which I'll show you products from. And um, we're soon to get a boundary layer wind profiler, an acoustic wind profiler. Um, and we have plans for a Doppler LIDAR to give us winds at the site. Um, this just shows you our site at Vancouver International Airport, which is a twin for this study. I'm not going to talk much about it. 
and that's what the, the instruments are far more basic in Vancouver. So we have a, um, um, a suite of airports we're looking at. This is Vancouver and all its alternates, and we also have Toronto and its alternates. And I'm going to discuss this chart more than, um, than the uh, West chart today. For each airport, we produce a situation chart um, that has the various variables that ten forecast for 10-minute variables, 10-minute uh, intervals out to two hours, and hourly thereafter out to six hours. So we're predicting winds uh, for the various runways, um, visibility, ceiling, shear and turbulence, precipitation, thunderstorms and lightning, icing. Um, Airport arrival rate, which is based on weather only, the cat level, and the runway conditions. We also have um, uh, a TAF Plus produced by the Aviation Weather Centers. And we have an ca on-site camera, and we have, we're also producing forecasts for the uh, uh, bed posts. I'll show you some real-time stuff later on. The thresholds, where all the things, the colors change are indicated here for crosswinds and visibility, ceiling, shear and turbulence, precipitation, thunderstorms and lightning. For example, it goes red when there's uh, lightning within six statute miles of the airport. And um, icing, the cat level. This is what we need radio runway visual range for. Can't get cat level without that. And um, and we're predicting runway condition and, and weather only airport arrival rate. So, oh yes, I wanted to just show this. This is our uh, lightning map. Um, Bill Burroughs produces this from the lightning arrays that are out there. Uh, and then he forecasts where the lightning is going to go. So this, this uh, based on um, uh, NWP information, uh, the, r the red line here indicates where that lightning is projected to go in the next two hours. Also at the site we have a vertically pointing radar, and I like this one because it shows you a freezing rain case. You can see the ruck sounding here. Uh, so the, um, this is the uh, bright band, the first bright band, and then um, actually it ends up at the ground at freezing rain. This is reflectivity, this is the Doppler velocity, and you can see as it goes from snow to rain, the uh, vertical velocity increases. Uh, this was an interesting case to watch in real time, and we also had a, um, we have the microwave profiling radiometer, which shows you, this is the zero degree line here, our American colleagues, and uh, shows you the warm tongue and then the cold, cold tongue here. So now let's, let's see if this works. I can go to the website. We have a website which is available to the um, uh, aviation people in real time. Um, and it's available to external users by, the, by a password only. And can I go down? So that's just showing you it's going to be really bulky. That shows you what the airports are like today. They're all green, which indicates there are no issues today. Um, makes forecasting pretty easy. If you click on, for example, Toronto, it'll bring up the situation chart, which is kind of boring today. It's all green. And um, if you hover on any of these, you get additional information. I don't know whether it'll work over the web. And you can also click on these barbs to get, uh, for example, if they're going to work. Plots, for example, the, the blue dots here indicate the crosswind. Um, these are the various models. Uh, we're plotting here are the rapid refresh, the high resolution rapid refresh, and the reg regional model. Um, so actually. It's not very com easy to do when uh, you're doing it remotely. At any rate, this is the first uh, three hours, and then it goes out six hours for a forecast. Um, and you get an idea of how well the models were doing 
um, in the past. And just to give you an idea, I don't know, it's not going to work very well over this landline. This just shows you the temperature with all of the models. Here we have the, the Canadian high res or higher resolution model, two and a half kilometer, the regional model, which is 10 kilometer, the rapid refresh, which I believe is. Um, uh, three kilometers and the high resolution rapid refresh and the rapid refresh. And then the observations from the observer in black and then the sensor is in blue. So that gives you an idea. I'm going to get off of this because it's too cumbersome. Don't X, no, no, don't X that, George. No? No. Just okay. X that, yeah. And go back, just m close your tab or minimize it, sorry. Minimize the window. Minimize the window? Yeah, there you go. OK. At any rate, if you want a tour of the site for the, for the Canadians, I can do that, provide that for you. This just shows you an example of the fact that uh, conditions change rapidly. Uh, this just shows you visibility or runway visual range as a function of time. And then the precipitation phase as a function of time from our various sensors. And the purpose of this graph was merely to show you the, uh, the rapid changes that can occur at an airport um, and the need for high resolution observations and high resolution um, predictions. Now I'm going to show you some um, verifications that we did uh, for the um, winter of um, uh, 09 10 and the summer of 10, 2010, uh, for uh, Toronto. And this just shows you the mean absolute error for temperature, relative humidity, wind speed, wind direction, the maximum wind speed or gusts, and the crosswinds for the three runways. And, and um, of interest here is the fact that the uh, relative humidity errors are quite high. This is, by the way, climatology. You just took, took the climatological value for that hour and uh, used it. You would get that error. So, so what happens is the models are not getting be even beating climatology, which is pretty bad for relative humidity. For wind direction, there are also incredibly large errors in the mean absolute error. You can see that in both the um, wintertime and the summertime. The relative humidity error gives us problems when you we're trying to um, predict um, fog. And um, the wind direction error is really critical because uh, Nav Canada tells us the most important thing for us to predict at an airport is wind and wind direction for change of runways. So, uh, what one could say maybe those wind direction errors are caused because we're looking at all wind directions. And uh, so we looked at the errors for just wind speeds greater than five knots. And there are still substantial errors for both the winter and the summer for the regional model, the land model, and the RUC at six hours. And just to give you an idea of the kinds of errors that can occur and the value of persistence. This just shows you the, the um, uh, verification for 1st of December 09 to 31st of March 2010. This uh, uh, blue, do these yellow dots are the clim climate average. We have to beat the cl climate prediction. The green is the uh, GEM regional. The uh, red line is the GEM, oh, sorry, the red line is the GEM regional and the and the green line is the lamb. Uh, somehow I think that's reversed, but at any rate, it doesn't matter. And the blue is the ruck. The interesting thing about this is this is persistence. If you said at 03 um, this value was going to persist, this is the kind of error you would get uh, going out into time, out to six hours. So. In this particular case, persistence would beat all the models and, and even the climate average. 
And in this case here, maybe the uh, uh, after about five hours, um, uh, the model is doing better than persistence. But it changes as a function of time of day. As you can see here, maybe it only takes a couple hours before the models take over from persistence. This just shows you that. Um, this just shows you now for wind gusts the same kind of thing. Uh, and um, in this case, uh, the models were not doing very well at this time, these times of days, at least the Canadian models. The U.S. rock model was doing much better. Um, but as you went into these times, uh, the, um, the models were doing better. So verification should be done at the time of day. Um, now I'm going to show you a bit of our results from our now casting and um, algorithms. And the main idea behind now casting is that extrapolation of observations by whatever means you, you use can produce a better skill in numerical forecast models in the short term. So um, basically, um, this is the now cast. This is the NWP in terms of forecast lead time and information content. And um, at a certain crossover point, the now casting uh, cannot beat the NWP models. I'm going to show you some results like that. So we are using two different now casting methods for making predictions in the short term. One is called the Adaptive Blending of Observations and Models, or ABOM. It looks at the forecast at a lead time. And it looks at the current observations, the change predicted by the observation trend, and the change predicted by the model. And it, you train these coefficients based on the recent history usually six to eight hours. And then we have an INTW system which combines predictions from several NWP models by weighting them based on the past performance, usually six hours, and then doing a bias correction. And it should be SNOW V10. It's called SMO V10. It's used uh, three different models. For most of the predictions I'm going to show you, we use the, the GEM, the regional, and the uh, RUC model. And these are just papers that show, describe the various techniques. Most of them are, are, are online now. You can access them. They were accepted in 2012. So this just shows you the NWP model with a minimum mean absolute error in CAN now for the winter and the summer periods for Pearson and Vancouver. Let's just look at Pearson. Um, you can see that. Uh, in this case, for temperature, for example, in the winter, the regional model produce, produce the best minimum, uh, minimum absolute error, whereas in the summertime, the ROC model did. Um, what the takeaway message from this is that different models do better at different locations and for different parameters. And that's one of the values of the uh, INTW system, because it uh, basically checks the accuracy of all the different models and produces a, a forecast. And INTW, for the same kind of comparison, produced the best forecast for all of these variables. The time for the model to beat persistence is given in this chart. So for example, the LAM for um, Toronto uh, for temperature, it uh, took six hours before the LAM beat persistence. And uh, for the INTW, which used both the LAM, the regional, and the RUC, it took two and a half hours before it beat persistence. Uh, and um, the, the top chart is for the winter, the bottom chart is for the summer. And you can see, if you look at this, basically the integrated system, uh, NowCast system, uh, was beating the models in terms of when, the, when it reached the crossover point for persistence. And this just shows you a, the ABOM technique, uh, the similar kind of things. This is temperature for Toronto. Uh, and this shows you the, um, the, the LAM error. It turns out when you average everything over all the time, time periods in this, you get to end up with a straight line. Believe me, it's counterintuitive, but you do. And this is the error for the regional. In this case, the regional model was doing better than the LAM. This black line is persistence. What would happen if you just used persistence? 
And then um, the ABOM, which is using either the LAM or the regional model, is doing better than persistence. So that's one of our rules of thumb. The, the technique is not very good unless it's beating persistence. And that just shows you for relative humidity, which has a large error, as you can see, uh, upwards of 10%. 10 percent. Um, uh, persistence here is a better indicator, and of course the ABOM technique is doing better overall than uh, persistence. Now I'll just show you some, categ some um, categorical forecasts. We subdivided the um, uh, some of the variables into various categories based on our thresholds, and we needed to do that for things like visibility and ceiling. So I'm going to concentrate on those. And um, uh, the problem, of course, with visibility is you can get to unlimited visibility, and for ceiling you can get unlimited uh, ceilings, and those cause you great um, pain when you try to uh, put them into a numerical scheme. So that's why we're doing these by these categories. And um, then we calculate a high-key skill score which on these categories, which is this complicated-looking equation here. And what the high-key skill score does it tells you what the what was the accuracy of the forecast in predicting the correct category relative to that of random chance. So zero is no skill and one is perfect a perfect skill. And now I'm also going to show you the ACC scores or the accuracy score, and that is the what is the fraction of the forecast that were in the correct category. Again, zero is no skill, one is perfect skill score. So this just shows you the uh, winter and the summer for ceiling, precipitation rate, visibility. By the, there, we have run two visibility schemes. One is uh, uh, produced by um, Bill Tuppy and Milbrandt, and one is produced by Budala and Isaac. There are different papers, so we're evaluating them both. And of course, we're using the RUC scheme, which is also a different scheme. Uh, and then, of course, the crosswinds, precipitation type, so forth. I'm just going to concentrate on the ceiling and the visibility. You can see that the, the top number is the HSS score and the bottom number is the ACC score. And these are, these are not bad numbers. Um, they're showing that we, there's, a, there's room for improvement. Remember, one is a perfect score and zero is no skill. So there, you can look at these numbers and say, maybe they're not that great. If you look at individual cases, they look pretty good. And one of the things we looked at, what happens if you relax the, uh, the timing of the score? For example, we were insisting that the visibility occur exactly when the, when the observation happened. And so we said, well, what was the minimum visibility within an hour um, uh, of the forecast? And um, you don't really get uh, a great improvement by doing that. So. Um, it didn't appear that that was a problem. So in a summary, um, we're making progress to, f to forecast aviation-related variables using numerical model output and nowcast schemes. We, al we already have a system which uses climatology, which is called WIND3. And I didn't describe that. Uh, the WIND3 system does uh, ceiling and visibility uh, with a um, artificial intelligence type technique. Uh, so it uses NWP, it uses the um, climatology, and it uses the uh, uh, existing uh, uh, observations. Our relative humidity predictions are poor. They barely beat climatology, and that impacts our visibility forecast. Our visibility forecasts are poor from a statistical point of view, but um, I think if you look at individual cases, you get a better impression from them. The cloud-based forecast show some skill, but they could be improved with better model resolution in the boundary layer, and that's coming, at least for the Canadian models, in this fall. Um, the wind direction is either poorly forecast or measured, and I believe it's poorly forecast. I don't have a good reason for that. Um, and there are many difficulties in measuring parameters like precipitation amount and type, which I haven't, didn't have time to go into. Overall, the statistical scores do not show the complete story. We need to need an emphasis on high impact events. And um, uh, I didn't go through that because I don't have time to go through some case studies. 
the selection of the model point to best represent the site is a critical process, and uh, that was really critical for Vancouver because it's near a big water mass. It's right on the water. And uh, if you pick a point that's just uh, over the water, just away from the site, you can get a quite different result. Um, the weather changes rapidly, especially in complex terrain, like, like a land-water interface. It's necessary to get good measurements of time resolutions of at least 1 to 15 minutes. And, um, and we try to get measurements at 1 minute resolution. And because of the rapidly changing nature of weather, um, uh, the weather forecast must also be given at a high time resolution. Um, I think that's one of the, the weaknesses of the task. They tend to smear things over a long time. Um, the verification of mesoscale forecasts and nowcasts must be done with the appropriate type of data, and that means data not just collected on an hourly basis. And the nowcast schemes which blend NWP models and observations of the site outperform in individual NWP models and persistence after one to two hours. Hopefully I showed you that. We're currently using products to develop a first guess TAF. Um, that TAF, first guess TAF is being tested at the Aviation Weather Centers now. It's running the, uh, it's using the algorithms we've developed for the CAN now system. That's why I say we've sort of gone beyond the nowcasting system and for the time and we're looking at uh, 24 to 36 hours. Um, and last week at a recent intensive review period where we had the forecasters and the researchers working together, um, first of all, we saw a lot of positive results come out in terms of forecasting VFR conditions. Uh, for example, maybe 40% of the, at least Thursday and Friday of last week, 40% of the forecasts were VFR. And um, it looked like the, the um, first gas task could have been used for those. Uh, they weren't being used. It was just being a test, of course. The, um, the first gas task could have been used to, to produce those VFR forecasts. Um, the algorithms definitely need some improvement. For example, low cloud is often predicted in the Arctic under cold conditions when skies are clear. Uh, we're discussing that with our colleagues in Montreal, why that happens. It's a really perplexing issue for us. And there are many issues with re precipitation type that uh, we need for the first guest half. But we're making progress and um, uh, things are moving forward. And that's it. Thank you, George.